Now you know a little bit about Annie Armstrong and why we named the offering after her. Uh, we will be taking up our Annie Armstrong offering next week, so come prepared to give to that. You can also give to that online as well. Uh, while I'm speaking about giving, uh, if you look in your bulletin, you can see on the, I don't know, the last inside page, uh, the list of things that we are taking up for Operation Christmas Child uh, this month. And uh, that's coming to a close. Next month, we're going to do something else, and we'll be talking about that more next week. Uh, but uh, one of the things that uh, came to us in the office was we need a way to, uh, if we want to give to support this, how do we do this, okay? So we've added a, a slot online called Samaritan's Purse, which is the umbrella that Operation Christmas Child works under. That's Franklin Graham's ministry uh, organization, Samaritan's Purse. And now you can give online towards that. So if you give towards Samaritan's Purse online, uh, then the monies that you give will go to support uh, the, the, the purchase of items that we might need to fill boxes, if that makes sense. Okay. So just keep that in your, in your, in your hat there as we move throughout uh, uh, the year. 
and we want to be a mission-minded church, whether that's taking up Annie Armstrong uh, next week, whether it's uh, helping pack Operation Christmas Child boxes that are, are, are gospel opportunities everywhere those things go around the world, or whether that's talking to your neighbor about their relationship with the Lord. We want to be missionaries here at Mount Gilead. we got a lot of things going on. I want to remind you of those. Uh, tonight we'll be right here at 5 p.m. Uh, Brother Bradley will continue uh, preaching and teaching on spiritual warfare. Uh, so that'll be tonight at 5. The Blood Mobile is out here uh, from 11 to 4 today. So if you would please consider giving uh, to that. Uh, maybe they give you a chocolate chip cookie or something for your, for your uh, efforts. Uh, but everything that Blood South uh, receives, all that goes to our local hospitals here. Uh, none, it all stays right here in the Wiregrass area. All right? Tomorrow we've got a Sunday school teachers meeting. So if you teach Sunday school, we want you there for that. Children all the way up through adults. And uh, we'll have a meal and, and, and some training and, and we'll, we'll do some talking and things like that. Uh, but that'll be tomorrow. That'll begin at 6. We try to be very aware of your time right there. We don't want to keep you all night. So we're usually out of there by 7.30 at the latest. All right. Uh, Deacon's meeting's coming up. Family Life Center will be closed not this week but next week. A couple of days for voting. We're a polling station for Houston County. Uh, and uh, the rules say that when those when they get set up for all of that stuff, we have to lock all that down so we can't have people in and out of the gym, okay? Uh, I said Annie Armstrong will be next week. Preschool Easter breakfast is coming up, and VBS right around the corner, all right? Let's pray, and after I'm done, we'll stand and greet one another. Father, we're grateful to be here. We love you, and we want to thank you for today. God, we're here to praise you. Uh, for each and everything that you do in our life. And if we began to list them, uh, we could fill this room full of notebook paper. But God, we are grateful that uh, you are with us today. And we want to show gratitude for your grace. We want to show gratitude for your mercy and your guidance, your provision, your protection, your love. Uh, we want to do that in, in these moments. So God, as we sing, I pray that you would uh, you would just uh, listen to our hearts. And as we hear your word, God, I pray that you would speak to us. That if we need a challenge, that you would challenge us. And if we need uh, encouragement this morning, that you would encourage us. But God, I pray that your spirit would speak to us through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, stand and greet one another. Would you sing this wonderful old hymn with me? Years I spent in vanity. Sing it with me, would you sing it? Years I spent in vanity and pride And caring not my Lord was crucified And knowing not it was for me He died on Calvary Mercy there was great and grace was free and there was multiplied to me There my burdened soul found liberty At Calvary And by God's word at last my sin I learned Then I trembled at the law I spurned Till my guilty soul in glory turned to Calvary Grace was free, but there was 
Oh, I pray you're hungry and thirsty this morning just to worship him. Here's a song by Keith Getty that we learned some years ago. He's the one who holds you and keeps you in security until you're all your days, till the early end. It's when my fears, sing it with me, church. When my fears, my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fear. sings a beautiful song called All Praise Rising.
If there is any peace, any love, if there is any joy, let it rise. If there is any good, any just, if there is any grace, let it rise. If there is any breath, any sound, if there is any light, let it rise. churches where they say you shouldn't clap after worship. I don't see how you don't. I don't see how you just don't resonate with the joy of the Lord of heaven and Christ and the gospel that the choir just sang about. And so what we do when we respond is like we agree. Amen. We agree. And just think we're not even in heaven yet. That was, that was got to do that here. I tell you. I tell you. We don't have to preach. We could just go home. That was good. Now we're going to. I mean it's weird. I, I spent all this time this week preparing this message. You're going to listen to it. But that was, that was fantastic. Thank you, choir. And as we continue in worship, we continue through um, prayer and, and giving. And we talked about the Annie Armstrong, uh, e, uh, the, uh, the Easter offering coming up. So important as we give uh, uh, to um, local church. I say local church here in the North America as we send church planners throughout North America because I can tell you there's no nation on earth that needs Jesus more than North America does in America Amen. and for, for sure. And so we give believing that, uh, that what the choir just sang about is ever more true and that the church will rise. We'll rise when the Lord comes back from us, but even now we will rise to, to meet the needs uh, that the Lord uh, calls from us as we seek to accomplish the mission that we're here to do. And even now as we give in tithes and offerings, we know that we give back just simply because we've been given to. And the Lord calls us to give to glorify Him and to fund His mission. So let's pray in that direction. Father, we glorify You. Father, we thank You for the promise that the church will arise and that You are even now raising up a people for Yourself to accomplish a tremendous end on this earth and for your will forevermore. Father, I pray now as we give, Lord, that we give faithfully, that we give uh, with a joyful heart, a cheerful spirit. Lord, that we give um, sacrificially, knowing that you gave sacrificially for us and that you call us to give because you are worthy of all that we have and all that we are. Lord, we pray that you'll be glorified as you produce great fruit in us today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Let me invite you to take your copy of God's Word open to the book of John. John chapter 15 is where we are. John 15, we spent about uh, six weeks getting through all the stuff in John 14, uh, verses 15 through 31. But now we're in John 15, and God willing, we're going to move through eight verses today. Uh, John 15, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to read this passage this morning from the English Standard Version of the Bible. That's just the version that, I've, that I use. I invite you to follow along the version that you use. I'd like for us to stand as we do this. John, John 15. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, and then I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to pray. If the Lord allows you to join me on your knees, I invite you to do that or remain standing to honor God's word as we pray. We're in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples now that they've left, uh, the, they finished the discourse in the upper room after the, after the Last Supper. And uh, you might see them now traveling. Some people wonder if, they, if he's actually walking with the disciples, passing uh, the vineyards here or, or whatnot. Um, anyway, and this is what he says. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. And if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Pray with me. Father, that is our desire this morning, is that we would be a fruit-bearing branch. That as a church, we'd be a vineyard of fruit-bearing people. Lord, that, the, that you might be glorified as we prove to be your disciples. And the power of the Holy Spirit would work through us as we seek to bring the gospel, the glory of God in Christ Jesus to this dark and dying world. And Father, that you might change the world through the people that you have changed by your spirit and through the power of the gospel of Christ. Father, we pray that you'll teach us today. Lord, this is an important passage to help us understand what you're doing in us this very moment. Open our eyes, open our hearts. Help us to understand, but also help us to experience the power of your Spirit. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, so work this morning as I preach for your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus starts talking to his disciples uh, this morning in this passage. He starts with two of the most powerful words that Jesus ever uttered while he was on this earth. I am. I am. Uh, this is the last of the seven I am statements that we're given in the book of, of John. You know, I am. It may not sound like two very powerful words to you, but if you were in that context, if you were a Jew at that time, it would, it would land on you much differently. Uh, you will remember when God, back in Exodus, I'm in and out, he called Moses to go, uh, go and deliver his people from Egypt out of slavery and uh, under Pharaoh. And Moses is like, well, God, this, that's kind of a tall order. <laughs> you just, not, he's just not going to just let me. All right, well, we want to take your people. Uh, uh, let's, uh, you just let them go. He's not going to do that. Who, whose authority am I speaking on? Who am I to say has sent me? And God responds. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. 
I am has sent me to you. I am. So when Jesus uses this kind of language to describe who he is, when he says, I am, things like the bread of life, or I am the true vine, right? What he's saying is, he's saying that I am of the same nature as the I am. It is a divinity claim. He's saying that he is indeed the son of God. And in these seven I am statements, he's helping us understand something about who the character of the father is by helping us see something about who the character of the son is. And so here in verse 1, he says, I am the true vine. And so what he's teaching us something about who God is, but also what we're going to see is he unfolds this analogy, something about who we are and how God works in us. And so he gives us this, it's, I don't know what to call it. Robbie Ann Gilbert could probably help me here. It's a metaphor, it's an allegory, it's an analogy, something to that effect. It's a word picture, not the best way I, I know to say it, that every person in a rural environment can understand. Uh, and of course, in that day, they were pretty much mostly uh, rural people. And so uh, they understood what he meant. And I think here in South Alabama, by and large, we understand uh, what he means as well. As he says, I am the true vine. Now, what I want to do to begin with is I want to work on understanding this metaphor, understanding the metaphor in verses 1 through 3. So we'll start with the vine and the branches. The first part of this connects with me because I grew up in South Mississippi where there are farms and fishing ponds and a great deal of hunting land. It was not hard at all during the right time of the year to find a good muscadine vine. And uh, so I'd love to go and grab some of those muscadines. I had to move all the way to South Alabama to find out what a scuplin was. <laughs> a scuplin. How many of y'all know what a scuplin is? All right, here we go. Got some good. Some of y'all look like y'all been drinking some scuplin wine. I don't know. I got my eye on y'all, right? No, it's just, it's just grapes, right? Wild, wild grapes. <clears throat> and so they indeed also were familiar with grapes grown to make wine. It's very much a staple part of that culture. And so <clears throat> Jesus, I mean, even Jesus tells a number of parables that include a vineyard. And so they would have understood this. These are very familiar. But in this time, when they hear this idea of the, the analogy of the true vine, they're going to think of something else besides Jesus because they are people who are well versed in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament uses the symbol of the vine to refer to mostly Israel. Israel. I'll give you an example in Jeremiah 21. God says, Yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned? Um, degenerate and become a wild vine. There he's talking about Israel. But here Jesus comes along and he says, well, you may have been a vine, but you're not the true vine. No, the true vine, Jesus says, is me. The true vine is here. The true vine is the one who is the I am. And this is important for us to know because Jesus is telling pretty, very clearly to Israel, I know you think you're the true vine, but you're not. Right? The source of life doesn't come from you. And I think that's important for us to know because we need to realize that while Israel wasn't the true vine, the church is not the true vine either. Because the church doesn't change anyone eternally. Only Christ can do that. Only Christ can change us from the inside out. So we need to be mindful of what vine we are attaching our branch to. The reason I say this is because too many people, I think, blame Jesus for what was the failure of the church. And the church is not the true vine. We are to be people who have been transformed by the true vine, that produce fruit because of the true vine. But the one that's producing fruit in the church, that's Jesus. We, doesn't, we don't produce it of ourselves. Now, <clears throat> the picture that Jesus is describing here is more of a vineyard. Notice how he describes the father here. He says, and my father is the vine dresser. I'll be quite honest with you. I didn't know what a vine dresser was. I, I, didn't, I didn't know. But I went back and I looked this up in the Greek. You know what the vine dresser is? It's a farmer. 
You could translate this as farmer. As a matter of fact, the word used here is often translated as one of the most common words used for farmer. Now, farmer, I understand. And so Jesus makes here, I think, our roles very clear in this analogy. The father, who's the farmer, owns the garden. He owns the vineyard. And Jesus is the vine, and his followers are the branches. And so I think the point's pretty clear. You and I are just branches. We're branches. We can't produce anything of real value without the farmer and the vine, the father and the son. Okay? So there's the branches and the vine. And now as we look at continuing in this analogy, we also see something of the father's care and pruning. In verse 2 he says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that, he may, that it may bear more fruit. So the father has care over the vineyard, the farmer. Let me say this. The father who's the farmer has care over the vineyard. And as the farmer, the farmer's got one particular role, one particular goal that he wants out of the vineyard. You know what it is? As much fruit as possible. That's what the farmer wants. I mean, you think about it. When farmers around here, when they're growing peanuts, or they're growing cotton, or they're growing whatever they're growing, what, what are they after? As much produce as possible. I mean, that's the goal. And so when, when the father looks at us, and we're the branches, all right, and he says, now I've got this vineyard, it's branches, and it has the vine, and I want as much fruit as possible out of this vineyard. And so he then begins to lay this out. And as he does... Remember, we're the branches. As he does, we begin to see that he's inferring three kinds of believers that are in the vineyard, the church. One is this. Uh, let's go to verse 2. I hadn't read verse 2 yet. Every, or maybe I did. I don't remember. I'll read it again. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that, there may, that it may bear more fruit. So three types of believers here first type believers who bear no fruit right no fruit every branch of me that does not bear fruit he takes away secondly there are believers who bear some fruit right and then when we go to verse 5 we're going to see that there are believers who bear much fruit and so to make the vineyard as fruitful as possible he does two things the farmer the father does two things he takes away fruitless branches and he prunes fruitful ones. Now, <clears throat> this actually makes a lot of sense, the people who understand about these things. I, I read up on that uh, the last couple of weeks, and here's what I learned. That the people that know about this, say in early spring, around February or March, the deadwood is unable, that was unable to bear fruit is cut away by the farmer. And then later, when the blossoms had become ripening grapes around August, these little shoots also shoot up around, and they are cut away as well so that the main fruit-bearing branches would receive all the nourishment. <clears throat> and so as I studied this, one thing became abundantly clear to me. Being a branch is hard. Being a branch is hard. If you're not fruit-bearing, you're cut on. If you are fruit-bearing, you're cut on. <laughs> you're trained. That's exactly right. Being a branch is hard. And so sometimes we look at all of these hardships that we experience in the church and, and in our own lives, and we ask, why do we seem to experience so much pain? It's often because we're being cut on. Why are we being cut on? Because the farmer wants to produce more fruit in us. And so remember, that's what the father is after. That's what the farmer is after, as much fruit as possible. So we as branches, when we're being cut on, and when it hurts and it's painful, we have to have faith that the farmer knows how to bring about the most fruit possible in us. That he knows what he's doing. We are encouraged with verses like Romans 8, 28. 
And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Not just the good things, but the bad things too. All things. When, when the harvest time, the fruit is plentiful, and the time when he's cutting on us, we're wondering what in the world is the Lord doing here? A lot of you can identify with that. You've been cut on. I've been cut on. God's done work in us. You know, you can tell when God's doing work in you because when you come out on the other side, you know what you realize? That you're not the same person you were before God started doing the work. You know? Um, how many of you have seen some progression spiritually in your life so that you would say, like, the you today and the you 15 years ago look significantly different, right, as a person? Amen. 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 And I think that's part of what, uh, what Jesus is saying to the disciples as he moves into verse 3 when he says, Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Even the disciples, they've been with Jesus now for some three years. And they've been challenged by Jesus. They've had their sin confronted. They've walked with Jesus. They've had repent of sin. They have seen God do tremendous uh, miracles through the work of, of Christ. They've seen people change. They have, they have changed. So basically what he's saying is, is that you've been pruned. You've experienced some pruning. So in your plant, if you will, there's already been some cleaning work that's already been done. And many of you can say that as well. Because you've been challenged. You've been challenged through some physical trials that you didn't know how you were going to make it through. But we say, God, I trust the farmer. And God cleaned you. Or maybe you were struggling, entangled with some type of sin. And the word of God convicted you of sin. You repented of sin. It transformed you. It freed you. You've gone through some pruning. And now, so when God looks at you, it's not that we don't need more pruning at times. But, but there is a Praise the Lord that we are more clean through the power of the Spirit and the power of the Word as we grow in Christ. And I think that's part of what he's saying. And so now we understand something of the metaphor. But now Jesus moves from just giving us the metaphor but to teaching us something from the metaphor. And so I'm going to call this bearing fruit as true believers. As he teaches, this is what he's talking about. Us bearing fruit as true believers. When you read the rest of the passage... There's a word that comes up over and over and over over the next few verses. A word that appears 11 times, no less than 11 times in the next few verses. Y'all know what it is? That's right. We, we see it show up immediately in verse 4 and 5. And let's just look at verse 4 and 5. It says, abide in me. It's a command. Abide in me. And I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Abide. It shows up over and over and over and over in this next paragraph. Well, what in the world does that mean? Here's what it means. It means you stay put. That's what it means. I mean, you stay put in Jesus. You remain there. Sometimes it's, tra it's translated that way. You remain in there. You remain in the same place over a long period of time. And so what he's saying is, is for you to bear fruit as a branch in the vineyard, you've got to remain in Christ. And as you remain in Christ and Christ in you, it changes you. There is a mutual indwelling that remains over your entire life if you're a believer. It's almost like the, the thought that came to my mind was this divine entanglement of the branch which is me and the vine which is Christ. The branch which is you and the vine which is Christ. So much so that you can't separate the two. It's the divine entanglement of your nature and Christ's nature that he and you and you and him and, and him and me and me and him and, and it transforms us. It, trans, it just, it's just, you can't separate the two. They're interlocked. It's, it's part of what Paul was talking about in Galatians 2.20 when he said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He said, the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God and love me and gave himself for me. So what he's saying is, is that what you see when, when I am living, it's not even me. It's Jesus. Now, it's me, but it's not just me. 
Right? And so that's what he's saying. He said this is this mutual indwelling, this divine entanglement. And I think it's absolutely essential to understand that and to experience that if you're going to be a branch that produces fruit because abiding is essential to that. Remaining same place for a long time. Now, I do think this is a, a good time to bring up a question that maybe you've already been asking. A question that I went into this text asking. What exactly is the fruit? I mean, it's the, if the Father is working and his main goal in the branches, in the vineyard, in the church, is to produce much fruit, what is it that he wants to produce from his vineyard, from his, from his church? Well, from time to time you hear people say that, you know, the fruit is, is winning others to Christ. And no doubt, winning others to Christ is certainly a desirable outcome for the, the church. That's the Great Commission. Go make disciples of all nations. Certainly, we, we want that. But I don't think that, or to me, it doesn't seem to be the focus of the analogy that Jesus is giving here. And particularly in the placement that it is in, in John. I think the fruit ties back to that divine entanglement, that mutual indwelling, that, that producing fruit comes from the natural byproduct of having Christ in you and you in him so that that fundamentally changes who you are and who I am. So put simply, I think that the fruit of the true vine coming off of our lives that he's talking about, that he wants much of, is Christ-likeness. He wants his church to look like Jesus. He wants his believers to look like Jesus. So that our thinking begins to be transformed by Christ's thinking. Our actions transformed by Christ's actions. Your love by Christ's love. Your words by Christ's words. Your generosity by Christ's generosity. Your sacrifice by Christ's sacrifice. And that's, that's the fruit of a branch that cannot be born by the branch alone. I mean, that requires the vine. It requires that indwelling. And the fruit that Jesus is talking about here can only come... Through abiding in the vine. Notice what he says in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. From a, for apart from me you can do what? Nothing. 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 And that makes so much sense to me because we can't muster up in our flesh the godliness indwelt in Jesus. We just can't do it. We cannot produce godliness as the branch. And so I think that's why he says that. You know, well, apart from me, you can do nothing. The branch, why does he say that? I think just, maybe just write this down. The branch has no life on its own. The branch has no life on its own. The only hope that the branch has to remain fruitful is to remain in the vine. And we rely on God to do the work of changing us to be like Christ because we could never do it ourselves. You know what Jesus is talking here? You know what starts to come to mind? A discussion that Paul has with the Galatian churches in Galatians 5. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Then I start to think, oh. So the indwelling that, that Christ is talking about is an indwelling that comes because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Because somebody has said, well, or we, we have asked, well, how is it that Christ can indwell in me and still be at the right hand of the Father? Well, remember John, the, the end of John 14, where we spent about six weeks unfolding this, and we spent about three weeks talking about whom? The Holy Spirit. 
Because it was right there that John, that, that he says that I am leaving, but I will send you a helper, right? The Holy Spirit. And guess what? John 15, for you math nerds, follows right after John 14. And so he's talking about the same thing. He's talking about how the Holy Spirit transforms his disciples. How we bear the characteristics of Christ through the working of the Holy Spirit. And in doing so, others accomplishes his goal of producing much fruit, much Christ likeness in the vineyard of his church. Now, there are consequences as we move on in this discussion of not abiding, consequences of not abiding. According to what Jesus has just said, abiding produces what? It produces fruit. And what is that fruit? It's Christ-like character, right? It's Christ-like love and actions and words and generosity and those, those types of things. Christ-like character, spiritual blessing. So if abiding produces spiritual fruit, what do you think not abiding does? Yeah, it produces deadness. Not abiding. If, if abiding is connection, then not abiding is disconnection. It's not remaining, right? And you know what disconnection produces? It produces dying. It produces dying. I want you to look at verse 6. He said, if anyone does not abide in me. Is that my thing bouncing around? Okay, that's fine. If anyone does not abide in me. He is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Let me take this. Wow. Things just got heavy up in here, Jesus. So what exactly does he mean? Well, scholars disagree. All right, so I'm going I'm to throw some thoughts out there to you, and I'll tell you what I think. Some come to the conclusion that what he's talking about here is salvation and that uh, being thrown into fire means that you can lose your salvation and be discarded into hell. Okay, that, that's, that's what he's saying. That you, you were saved, but you stopped abiding, and then therefore you lost your salvation, and now you're going to, to hell. Uh, but there are so many passages that are talking directly about salvation that teach absolutely opposite to that. I don't think that's, that's what he means. And I don't think that's what he means because of all the, the rest of the Bible, but also because of something Jesus says in verse 8. Because you might say that, no, nah, it's not about losing your salvation, but that not producing fruit over a long period of time, that, that Christ-like character isn't growing in you. It just means that you were never really saved. Now this, I think, is supported greatly in verse 8. Because look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so what? Prove. Prove to be my disciples. So it is in the bearing fruit that we are proving something. That the Holy Spirit lives in us. And if the Holy Spirit lives in us, the Holy Spirit lives through us, and he produces Christ-like character in us as we join in him with obedience. That's a byproduct of love. Remember, we spent a lot of time talking about that. So I think that's, that's, what, he's, that's what he's saying here. Um, and by the way, I just want to, and this is important, because he's talking about, he's talking to followers. So people that would argue with me about this would say, well, he's talking to followers right there. And, um, and so, are they saved or not? I don't know that I can put it in the follower language, but I can put it in this language. Just because you're a member of a church does not mean you are saved. Okay? That you can, quote, be connected to the family of God, all right, experience something of the blessings of God because of your connection to the true vine via, via the, the, the family of God and then fall away. You see it all over Scripture. So you see it in Judas and Demas, and it's not like that. This, like this, this happens. It happens all the time. But what does it prove? 
It, it proves that you may have been with us, but you were not of us. Right? It proves that you're not my disciples. But abiding and fruit producing proves that you are my disciples. So I think that's what he's talking about here. However, I will have to say, the thir- the, the, I do find some validity to a third option. I don't find any validity to losing your salvation option. And I think it's about proving that you are my disciples. However, some people say that it's about losing your rewards in heaven. And I don't know if it's about losing your rewards in heaven or not, but here's the, the connection that I, that I kind of get from this. It's more about, to me, when I experience backsliding. Anybody here ever struggle with their faith and, and struggle with times of backsliding where you're not, I mean, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, it's, it's fine. If, if, I, if you didn't raise your hand, then you would just be struggling with lying, you know, just whatever. <laughs> But never like, because we all struggle with this. So we all struggle with being, being backslidden. And the word that, that captures me here, like, because when I'm, when I'm like, you know, connected, when, when I say connected, I mean like in the word daily and praying daily and, and journaling and fasting and doing those disciplines that, that really flesh out this abiding and remaining. I, you know, and then I see spiritual fruit in my life and I go, that's, that's awesome. But when I'm not doing those things, when I'm not in the word like I should, when I'm struggling with some indwelling sin, when I'm uh, you know, not, not doing the things that a Christian ought to do, you know what I feel in my soul? Withering. Okay? Now, again, Jesus uses that word here. And that's why that connects with me a little bit. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And so there's something in me that kind of connects with that, that there are times in my life where just like a branch that's not producing fruit in a, in a vineyard is, is useless, there are times that I feel useless for the kingdom because of my lack of obedience in allowing the vine to produce fruit in me. Does that make sense? I'm just being honest. Like, I see a connection there. So, um, but I think, more than anything, he's talking about proving over a long period of time that we are disciples by how the Holy Spirit works in us. Either way, what's the point? Abide! Remain. Like, don't, don't worry about it. If, if you continue to seek Christ with all of your heart, you don't have to worry about that because that is proving that the Holy Spirit lives in you. All right, let's finish this up with the effects of abiding on prayer. It just comes out of nowhere to me because he says uh, something that I didn't expect. He says, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask Whatever you wish, it'll be done for you. When I read that, I think to myself, Jesus, that is a dangerous promise. I mean, abide, because I think I'm abiding. I'm remaining. I've been a believer a long time. The Lord's working in me. And if when it comes to prayer requests, man, I have got a long list of stuff that I would like for you to answer. Right? I got stuff to ask for. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think what he's saying is this. You know what happens when you abide? That entanglement. Mutual indwelling. Christ in you, you in him. And it changes you. It transforms you. It changes the way you think. It changes the way you love. It changes the way you act. It changes the words you use. Let me tell you these things. It changes what you desire. And so when Christ is in you, when you are in him, and that, there's a fruit-bearing Christ-likeness happening. Here's what happens. You begin to desire the very same thing that God desires. The farmer desires. And guess what? God gives you what he desires. You know what God desires as the farmer? More than anything, what is the farmer after? More fruit. Let me tell you a prayer that will get answered. Lord, make me more like Jesus. Lord, help me get angry less. Lord, help me show more love. Help me be quick to show forgiveness. Lord, help me 
depend upon you the way Christ depends upon you? Help me pray like Jesus. See, you, you see what I'm saying? Those kind of prayers, they get answered because those prayers are a byproduct of being transformed by the vine. And as we come to a close, I want to quickly move back to verse 8. He says this in verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. What is it that God desires, or why, excuse me, that God desires so much fruit, more fruit from his vineyard? So he can be glorified. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Good Bible study. So you can be glorified. Why does greater Christ-likeness from the church, from believers, glorify God all the more? Because it shows how great of a farmer he is. Look what God did in you through Christ. It's amazing. It's what's allowed us to kind of throw a hissy fit after the choir sang. Because it reminded us of the change that, that we will rise. That we are people who deserved hell. We were the people who deserved the wrath of God over our sin. That we were once rebels. That we were once, once at enmity with God. But God makes us children of God. And as children of God is transforming us into the character of God through the person of Christ. Who is working through the power of the Holy Spirit. Even as Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit is living in us. Working through us to make us like his son. The Father did all that. Now that's a farmer. That's a farmer. That's what he's doing in the church. And how the church will change the world with the vine. Because of the power and the wisdom and the excellence of the Father. As he works out his plan through his Son. To create a people for himself. And then to reach every tribe, tongue, people group, and nation. It's quite the farmer. All right. Now, last week I was chastised a bit because the last two weeks I don't think I had a Spurgeon quote about anything. So to avoid the chastisement, I thought I'd give you a good Spurgeon quote about this. You might not be able to read that, so just listen to me. He says this. Spurgeon wrote this. The Lord Jesus Christ, looking around his church, if he sees anything evil in it, will do one of two things. He will help me see. <laughs> Either he will go right away from his church because the evil is tolerated there. And he will leave that church to be like Laodicea, to go on from bad to worse until it becomes no church at all. Or else he will come and he will trim the lamp. Or to use the figure of John 15, he will prune the vine branch. And with his knife will cut off this member and the other and cast them into fire. While as for the rest, he will cut them till they feed again. Because they are fruit-bearing members. But they have too much wood. And he wants them to bring forth more fruit. It is not a trifling matter to be in the church of God. Indeed it is not. Pray with me. Father, it is not a trifling matter to be in the church of God. Thank you for Spurgeon helping us understand this, but thank you all the more that Spurgeon understood it because Jesus taught it. Jesus taught it to his disciples. Jesus has taught it to us. And so, Father, I pray that we would evaluate our hearts right now through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we are one of three types of believers, one of three types of branches. We are branches that produce no fruit. We are branches that produce some, or we are branches that produce much. And, Father, for some, 
that produce no fruit. Father, the Bible says that uh, the farmer will come along and remove that branch. And that branch will be thrown into the fire, removed from the body of Christ, removed from the vineyard. It is of no value. It does not have the vine. It does not have the spirit. It does not have Christ in us, the hope of glory. There is no entanglement, so there is no Christ-likeness. Lord, I pray for those that are here this morning that may be even church members that are branches, quote, of the visible church, but are dead. And so, Father, I pray, though, there was a day that this branch was dead, but you made me alive through the power of Christ. There, there was a day that all of us were dead in sin. But that's the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is not just to make us good. The power of the gospel is to make us alive. To make us bearing fruit of Christ's likeness. So that you are glorified as the wonder-working, miraculous farmer of the vineyard that you are. And so, Father, I pray for those that don't have life today. That you would transform them. Lord, before you cut them off, would you transform them? Would you give them life? Would you bring them to repentance? Would you, would you do a cleaning, pruning work to, to produce life? And because the life that comes, comes from the vine, it comes from Christ, so they need Christ. If that's you today and you just know I'm here and I, you may be a church member, you may not be a church member. You may be a member here at Mount Gilead. You may be a member somewhere else, but... You realize that church membership means nothing. What matters is the vine. Is the vine in you? Is there a divine entanglement, a mutual indwelling of Christ in you and you in him? And is that changing you over time? Are you seeing it change, him change you over time? If not, cry out to him right now, Lord, save me. Lord, I repent of my sin. I turn from you. I trust in Christ and Christ alone to make me right with God, to forgive me of my sin. I, I believe you died for my sin. I believe that you rose again so that in you I could have eternal life forevermore. Come and save me now. If that's you, you pray that prayer. You cry out to the Lord, he'll save you. In just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation, and I invite you to come and just say, I'm, I'm taking my first steps following Jesus. Preacher, show me what to do. Man, we'll give you that counsel, exactly what you need to show you what it means to be a follower of a true vine, to be a branch that produces fruit. Mind you, pruning is coming, but a true branch nevertheless. Maybe you're here today and you are a true, a true branch of the true vine. And you're in a time where you're struggling. And you feel the Father and He's cutting here and there and it doesn't feel good at all. We trust what He's doing. We don't have the wisdom to know what we need to have Christ's likeness produced in us, but He does. And that's his goal in us, to produce fruit, change the world. Allow yourself to lean into his wisdom. And trust the farmer. He loves you. He owns you. Father, help us to be faithful. Father, we want to be a people that produces much fruit much Christ-likeness as we go into the world, into our families, into our workplaces, with our friends. And Lord, we, as we think about Annie Armstrong and Lottie Moon and these mission offerings that we give to as we send missionaries, church planners right here at home and then around the world, and even as we go to Honduras and other places, Lord, we bring the gospel. Why? Because we have been transformed and we desire to see the one who has transformed us transform the world to bear fruit 
in every place, in every tribe, tongue, people, people group, and nation. Accomplish your work this morning, I pray. Maybe you're here and you realize that the Lord's been calling you to a greater work, maybe into full-time Christian service, and you're like, I've been pushing that away. That's just not fruit I, I wanted to <laughs> in my life. But you're ready to surrender. It's time to surrender. I don't know what fruit exactly how that looks in your life but would you ask the Lord to bear it and to make you obedient in this moment Father we turn to you produce your work and your fruit in us today as we make decisions in accordance with your will in Jesus name Amen Let me stand for it. Jesus keep me decisions made this morning and uh, these are decisions that uh, are a byproduct of the Holy Spirit just been working for for quite some time I want to introduce you first of all Miss Michelle Stevenson as she comes she has uh, has been a member of Mount Gilead before uh, a number of years ago and and uh, through a tremendous amount of journey and and through if you know her testimony quite a bit of pruning difficulty she's experienced. She's back at Mount Gilead, has so many friends and, uh, and, and church family here that she loves. And the Lord's led her back and said, uh, you know, I want uh, to Mount Gilead to be my church home. All right, she'll be coming by, uh, by letter from a local church in the area. If you affirm that, let it be known by saying amen. 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 Give the Lord a hand. I also want to introduce you to Jorge and Maribel Franco. And uh, where's Lorette? Lor Lorette here? Come on. Come on, Lorette. These are a family of wonderful believers. And, um, and Jorge and, and Maribel come today as they have been just been seeking God's will. God has moved them into the area. They are faithful believers, love the Lord Jesus Christ with all their, their heart and soul. And uh, they, they are coming by statement of faith, uh, seeking to unite with Mount Gilead as a church home. If you affirm that, let it be known by saying amen. Amen. Glory to God. Y'all scoot down a little bit. Let the folks sit down. Let <laughs> y'all sit down. That's good when you got, uh, you got so many decisions, you got to move people around. That's just a good thing. And then I want to introduce you to Shane Cruz. Some of you know Shane, and, and, and some of you don't. 
but uh, this is an example of um, somebody loving Jesus enough to uh, see somebody in his workplace and say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. What's going on in your life? Shane is a fine young man. He sure is. And God's been working in his life in just unbelievable ways. And last week he, he came to me and said, you know, I, 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 I want to follow Jesus. I've made a decision in my life. I'm, I'm following Jesus. I'm repenting of sin, trusting in Christ. I want to follow in believers' baptism. And uh, thus he will make his church home here as he does exactly that. And we're going to be talking to him um, all the more about um, salvation and what that means and the counseling that comes along with that. But if you affirm his decision to follow Christ uh, today, would you let it be known by saying amen? Amen. 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 Now, I know you went and sat down, but you're all going to have to stand right back up. All right? This is what's, what's going to happen. Um, somebody's going to come and pray for us. Uh, Bobby Martin. <laughs> I, I never look. I'm so sorry. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, well, Bobby's one of our elders, been, been uh, one of our elders, founding elders, for, for, for that matter, at Mount Gilead. I say founding. Since we've had an elder body, he's not like his own the church. That's not. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, I'm digging myself a hole here. He's going to close us out with, with prayer, but uh, after he does, I, you know, you're, you, after you're sent, the first place I want you to go is I want you to welcome those who have connected with Mount Gilead as their church family today. Okay, so come down and uh, just welcome them home. All right, is there anything else, Brother Danny? Where's Brother, Brother Danny? Brother Danny, is you, you're good? All right, amen. We invite you back tonight, 5 o'clock. Uh, we're going to continue to talk about uh, spiritual warfare. Uh, we don't have uh, a training meeting for our elders today, so elders enjoy some time uh, with your family this afternoon. All right. And, and for our guests that are here today, um, Brother Mike and I will be in the welcome guest room through this door directly to your left. I'd love to meet you and to get to know you, find out how we can pray and minister to you more meaningfully. All right. Now, as, as uh, Brother Bobby has come to, to pray, I just remind you, after he does, we're not dismissed, but we are sent. We have the gospel. Let's go change the world. Okay. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for meeting with us today and allowing us to be a part of this special service. I, uh, I praise you that you've added to the branches here at Mount Gilead Baptist Church, and I just ask you that as we go out this week, that we will share your love with people. We will be that face and voice that uh, you speak through us. And God, as, as we look at your word today, I ask you to prune us, uh, help us to bear more fruit. And as we fight the spiritual battles, God, uh, I pray that your Holy Spirit will empower us with your love, your wisdom, and your grace. And Lord, we be mindful that there are others out there today sitting here that are lost and don't know you. I pray that you'll take the bells off their eyes your spirit will speak to them and trouble them and bring them into the fold. Send us out with your love and grace. In Christ's name, amen. amen.